Hi, everybody. I'm Craig. What's your name? No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> I have a story today called Elmer. Does anybody know the Elmer stories by, uh, by David McKee? Well, Elmer is an elephant. And this is a story about Elmer the elephant. And it's for all people of all ages. There once was a herd of elephants. Elephants young, elephants old, elephants tall and short and fat and thin, and all were different, but all were happy, and almost all were the same color, all except Elmer. Elmer was not elephant color. Um, he was a, a patchwork of colors. Elmer was yellow and orange and red and pink and purple and blue and green and black and white. Well, it was Elmer, though, who kept all the other elephants happy. Um, their games and their jokes um, were always his idea. So if an elephant was laughing, the cause was usually Elmer. But Elmer himself wasn't happy. Who ever heard of a patchwork elephant? He thought to himself, no wonder they laugh at me. So one morning, just as the others were waking up, Elmer slipped away into the jungle. And as he walked through the jungle, he met other animals, and, and they all greeted him because everybody knew Elmer. Good morning, Elmer, they said. Well, after a long walk, he found what he was looking for. It was a large bush covered with elephant-colored berries. So Elmer caught a hold of the bush, shook it until all the berries fell to the ground. And then Elmer lay on the ground and rolled over on the berries this way and that. He picked up the berries, rubbed them all over until he was covered with elephant-colored berry juice. Have you ever done that? No? Oh, I heard a yes over here. Uh, yeah. Um, so Elmer was no longer a patchwork of many colors. He looked just like all the other elephants, elephant colored. So when he rejoined the herd, none of the elephants noticed him. And as he stood there, Elmer thought something was wrong because he looked around. It was the same old jungle, the same old sky, the same old rain cloud, same old elephants, but the elephants were all standing still and they were silent and serious. Elmer had never seen them so serious. It made him want to laugh. <laughs> Finally, he could not bear it any longer. He lifted his trunk, and at the top of the voice, he shouted, Boo! <laughs> and all the other elephants jumped in surprise, and Elmer was helpless with laughter. And then the others began to laugh, and one of them said, Too bad Elmer isn't here to share the fun, laughing harder and harder. Then the rain cloud burst. Can you imagine what happened? Yeah, that's what happened. When the rain fell on Elmer, his patchwork started to show again. Oh, Elmer, gasped an old elephant as he you know, washed back to normal. You've played some good jokes, but this is the biggest laugh of all. What would we do without you? We must celebrate this day every year said another. All of us elephants will decorate ourselves in your honor, and Elmer will decorate himself elephant color. And so one day each year, the elephants color themselves yellow or orange or red or pink or purple or blue or green or black or white and have a parade. And if you happen to see an elephant in the parade that is elephant color, you know that it must be Elmer. Do you ever feel like Elmer? Different from the rest of the herd? Different from the rest of the kids? I do. What about you all? Yeah? But see, Elmer had something that no one else had, just like all of us. We each have something that no one else has. And it was worth celebrating in Elmer's herd. And you're worth celebrating too. The end. And as we enter into a time of silent prayer and meditation, um, I'm going to echo the
voice in the sorrows that we all keep in our hearts, the people in, in Paris and also in Lebanon this week, um, who, uh, wasn't it in Lebanon, the explosion this week, where people lost their lives? And of course, people are losing their lives in Syria, but um, in particular, the two um, acts of uh, terrorist violence that, uh, in these soft targets that make everyone just uh, get filled with fear and uh, community is what um, is the only thing really that can bring people any kind of peace uh, in this time. So let's hold them in our hearts. And um, these are some words that I have found um, beautiful by Susan Manker Seal. Um, I've adapted a little bit to enter into a time of silence. And she writes, um, this is a time for those who pray and for those who don't. For those who understand there to be some ultimate power that listens and can affect the world. And for those who know also that it is only through the power and love of our own hearts that we can make a difference. We pray to that which is beyond our understanding and naming. We pray to ourselves, to each other, to that yearning in each of our hearts for something better, something better for ourselves, for each other, for the world. Prayer is the seed, the guide, the vision, the direction. But it is our hands which must build a better world and our feet, which must walk the paths that lead to a loving, respectful human community. So let us pray yes, and then let us begin the work once again. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed in your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught to be afraid of people whose eyes are oddly made and people whose skin is a different shade. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you are six or seven or eight, to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be carefully taught. Those words are as sadly true today as they were when Oscar Hammerstein Jr. and Richard Rodgers wrote that song for their musical South Pacific in 1949. Imagine. When I spoke with Jim Harvin, who was kind enough to extend this uh, latest invitation to me to address you from this pulpit, he indicated that you are specifically asking your speakers to talk about a subject of spiritual growth or another matter from a personal perspective rather than merely referencing the experiences or views of others. If this congregation is anything like the other two UU congregations I've been spending a lot of time with this past year, those of Princeton and Monmouth County, New Jersey, some or many of you have been considering what steps you can take to explore racial pr privilege and how you can better ally yourselves with movement, movements con committed to anti-racism, anti-oppression work. This is my sixth visit to this congregation, I was, as was mentioned, over the course of these past years. And these have been years in which I have been inching ever closer 
to being ordained as a UU minister. So I too have been challenging myself to consider steps that I can take as a white person to work as an ally in anti-racist movements, ways I can acknowledge my entitlement, ways I can better understand the trauma and fear of others, ways I can disrupt racist assumptions by placing my own body in demonstrable places of resistance. So I took your invitation to look within to heart, and I'm hoping that you'll hear my words this morning as reflecting the trust that I have acquired for this conversation, for this congregation, sorry. Hope you hear my words as reflecting the trust I've acquired for this congregation these past years. Um, because exploring shame may well be the necessary hard road toward embracing greater authenticity, but it's not an easy road, not one I embark upon lightly. The truth is that while in a decisive and active way I am committed to asking more of myself in order to make a difference in the world of racial polarities around me, I sometimes find that deep down somewhere in my body there lingers a resistance to the work. Part of it is a fear that I won't be taken seriously that my white body won't be welcome at the march, that I will be thought to have shown up for a one-time photo op or the, for the bragging rights. Part of it is due to the exhaustion I feel over time, both from doing the work itself and from the sometimes scarce signs that anything I can do will ever make a difference. All of these things are, are understandable things for me to feel. Yet even further down, I have a gut feeling, one that takes on the ugly shape of resentment. It's then that I start to think that it isn't so much that the world around me is slow to change, but that I am, and that my resistance is born of something in me, carefully taught things that burn when jostled from their entrenched positions in my psyche. Yet I persist, and my words to you today are themselves an enactment of my persistence to risk exposing myself to potential discomfort in order that I might live less carefully restrained, less begrudged, that I might live more abundantly. Because I find it difficult to explain how I can possibly resent other people advocating for their rights, demonstrating for their recognition as human beings of worth. It feels like there is more work in me to do. You, you theologian and uh, philosopher Tandeka that's T-H-A-N-D-E-K-A, -E Tandeka. Wrote a book that is on the rest recommended list for UU ministers in training uh, entitled Learning to be White, Money, Race, and God in America. As an African-American woman, she wanted to understand white people's experience of their whiteness. What she discovered, which unfolds in the form of personal testimonies from folks she interviewed, is that white people have a very uneasy relationship to their whiteness, a relationship of tension, regret, shame, and dissembling. She recounts the story of Dan. In college during the late 1950s, Dan joined a fraternity. With his prompting, uh, his local chapter pledged a black student. When the national headquarters learned of this, it threatened to rescind the local chapter's charter unless the black student was expelled. Dan was elected to tell the black student member that he would have to leave the fraternity. Dan did so. 
As Dan told this story to Tandeka, he burst into tears. I felt so ashamed of what I did, he told her. I have carried this burden for 40 years. I will carry it to my grave. The book is filled with the personal memories of Euro-Americans of small, sometimes seemingly at the time, inconsequential defeats. Each of these incidents, however, when acknowledged, produces the disconcerting feeling that something about one's white identity is not quite right. This misalignment with one's own identity serves as part of the definition of what Tandeka identifies as internalized shame. Children who had to call off play dates with school friends, turn down dates to proms, who didn't take the opportunity to go over to a black fellow student in the cafeteria who looked all alone. All of these things tied on a deep level to the fear of losing something, losing a parent's love, financial support, approval of peers, neighbors, family members, fellow congregants. Small acts that people took in their lives in order to avoid being excluded from a source of powerful support. Acts that enabled white people to retain their right to be excluded from the excluded. We are all born wired for relationality, eager to interact with others. And then acculturation happens. Rather than being taught to live into our full, authentic selves, we are instead taught that to stay in relationship with our families, our races, our ethnicities, compromises will have to be made. We become complicit in systems that wound and devalue others, and ourselves get split off, leading to shame and to the many ways of covering that shame. Tandeka postulates that the very notion of a white identity is itself created through this acculturation process of denying portions of one's experience. White identity is, in essence, that community ideal which is created to cover over the shame that would have to be felt otherwise. White privilege, then, becomes the very right not to think about the shame at the heart of white identity. Yet the price of that privilege is the unsettling ongoing sense which Tandeka found in every person she interviewed, that they are never quite white enough. And that having had to squelch something originally true about themselves in order to be counted as white, shame has become a core emotional content around which racial identity is formed and about which resentment simmers just underneath the surface. Tandeka quotes from writings by Jewish-American journalist Norman Podhoritz, in which he talks of the compromises he made in order to become Americanized enough, read non-Jewish enough, to make it in his field. He freely discusses the rage that bubbles up inside him when he is brought face to face with the free, independent, reckless refusal on the part of black activists to submit to the rules of the white world to which he had already acquiesced. Black power expressed in a forthright claiming of personal integrity represented to Pot Horitz everything he had dared not give into lest his own defiance preclude his rise to position in a white Anglo world. Perhaps these stories resonate with you. They did with me, and not so much for their specific content, but for the underlying sense of shame that permeates them. To the degree that a child feels it necessary to split off parts of its emotional self in order to keep aligned with its family's sense of values and rules, that child's self develops as a compliant self, rather than one characterized by a sense of play and personal discovery. 
whether we are made to feel like we have to compromise in order to remain white enough, upper class or middle class enough, male enough or female enough, straight enough. Most of us, I would venture to guess, have scenes that replay in our minds associated with the shameful sense that we could have done better. We could have stood up to peer or family pressures. We could have stopped the bullying of another child from taking place. Or at least we could have refrained from participating in that bullying. But we so needed a sense of belonging, to feel like we fit in. There was power in being on the side of privilege, power to be a part of the in-group, power to have a self that knew where it stood because it so clearly could see where others stood, below, off to the side, on the other side of the tracks, people who couldn't join our country clubs of insularity. And especially Podhoret's words of resentment and rage spoke directly to me in their accuracy. When I see other people standing up for their rights, being fully present in their authenticity, it's so easy for me to feel assaulted by their otherness. Stop being so loud and in my face, I might feel. Couldn't you dress a little better if you knew you were going to be on national television? I, after all, have played the game of belonging to the mainstream. I have minded decorum. I have resisted rebellion. I have toned down affect. I have ignored or gone along tacitly with the telling of jokes at the expense of others. It's not that those others are lesser people, after all. I certainly wouldn't advocate for others to be treated any differently than I would be treated. That is, after I get what's mine. We each have our place in this game. And it's not absent in the African-American community, either. I just read New York Times culture writer and Columbia University professor Margo Jefferson's memoir, Negroland. In it, she reveals an underside to the Black Lives Matter slogan. For in her life, growing up among professional, affluent black folks in Chicago, she was only too aware of how much her black life mattered. Her particularities needed to be observed as exemplars for her race. In Negroland, her appellation, Jefferson writes, children were taught that most other Negroes ought to be emulating us when too many of them, out of envy or ignorance, went on behaving in ways that encouraged racial prejudice. Her memoir is filled with anger, lost childhood, regret, depression. She writes that she came to feel that too much had been required of her. She would have her revenge. She would insist on an inner life regulated by despair. How does someone like this, Jefferson wonders, so often ashamed of what she is, always ashamed of what she lacks, write about herself? Can one black life matter too much to too many? I'm suggesting that to the degree that we can bring ourselves to face some of the ghosts of our shameful pasts, to the degree that we can live more fully in our authenticity, we will be much better prepared to accept others in theirs. After all, what could possibly be threatening about another person claiming their right as a human being unless their claim somehow felt like it was infringing upon my own? And how could another's authenticity be an affront to me unless it showed me up in the degree to which I don't live fully authentically myself? I grew up in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where my parents had taken positions as teachers and administrators in the American international school system in South America. My father, in particular, began to assume more and more responsibility and he w until he was the superintendent of those schools, responsible for the children of people from over 40 countries in the world, children of ambassadors, diplomats, missionaries, CEOs of international business and finance. Since my world was centered in my school life, 
And since everyone at the schools answered to and was in large part hired and fired by my father, a standard of behavior was expected of me. Or that's the way I saw it, anyway. A standard that would put me, and by extension, my whole family, above suspicion, above reproach. Lest it be said that anything that came to me I got because of my connections, I became a juggernaut of excellence on every level. Academically, no one surpassed me. Out of the classroom, I was in every play, in the choir, in the band, on the swimming, volleyball, and baseball teams, editor of the school newspaper and editor of the yearbook, head of two churches, youth groups, counselor for younger kids at summer camps, and to spice it up, president of the International Students Cooking Club. <laughs> Yet I lived always one step away from being discovered to be less than I imagined I was required to be. Looking back, I see that much of that fear was tied to an internalized sense that being gay wasn't part of the script I was determined to follow. So I looked the other way when it came to my own sexual orientation. And there were times when I had to look the other way when gay folks who couldn't pass as well as I would be held up to scorn or ridicule, or worse, times when I joined in their maligning. You could say, well, I was a kid, protecting myself from the unknown, from hostilities, imagined and real alike. The reason I bring this up from the pulpit this morning, which I don't do lightly, is because like the folks in the stories told to Tandeka, I know that all of those compromises I made away from living into my own authenticity haven't been rendered non-operational. When I sit having my dinner watching same-sex couples lining up at state houses on TV, waving their marriage certificates, outwardly I'm filled with joy that things are changing in this country. Internally, however, I sometimes think to myself, do you have to be waving your rights around in my face? Couldn't you be a little more discreet? Less confrontational? I'm trying to eat here. My argument this morning is that for us to move into the kind of anti-racist, anti-oppression work that I believe is so vital for each of us to embrace, and for us to do it together as congregations, as a denomination, as a faith community, we may need to move into those areas of our own lives where our authenticities have been compromised, to examine the price that we have paid, are paying, in order to stay in the privilege that we are able to enjoy. The price that prevents someone else from dragging us down one of the notches onto which we or our ancestors worked so hard to pull us up. I believe that truly revolutionary work on these issues of personal integrity, of the worth and value of every person, requires that we move into areas that will make us uncomfortable, places that will feel emotionally risky, unguarded. With regard to self-disclosure, I, I do know that there is a difference between secrets and privacy. Everyone is entitled to some degree of privacy, and, and that includes me. And gay isn't a perfect label. It doesn't completely encapsulate me or even my affectional interests. But for me, this is the growing edge where I come face to face with my internalized shame. And so for me, to be the minister that I feel called to be requires that I extend myself into places where I will be asked to know how it feels just a little bit maybe, and in my own context, how it feels to be on the outside of privilege. It was, after all, my search for a pulpit free enough for me to preach authentically that led me to Unitarian Universalism in the first place. Speaking my mind on topics of my choice is very important for my life as a minister. However, even a free pulpit 
doesn't automatically translate into the ability to live authentically, to be fully present in my own particularities, and to own them as such. My temptation is to embrace the ability to be all things to all people, as if by rendering my selfhood as opaque as possible, others will be able to project onto me what they need for me to be in order to best serve them. That's a temptation I need to say out loud and that I am actively engaged in resistance. I know that if I can embrace myself in my own messy complexity a little more and a little more, it becomes less threatening to me that others do the same. And my ministry gains more places of personal contact to which others, to which you perhaps, can bring full selves. And where, together, we can get about the ministry of authentic advocacy and embracing love. The work of authenticity is not easy. Delivering these words to you this morning wasn't easy for me. But I believe that a congregation provides each of us with a setting uniquely suited to our moving forward, carefully teaching one another in ways that, yes, will challenge us, discomfort us even, so that life can be lived in ways that matter more and more, one day at a time, together. May it be so. Amen.